if I could just give some very brief background. Uh, you know, in 1968, uh, there was a Fluxus associated artist, Robert Filiou, who concepted the idea of an eternal network. And he was working that summer with another artist in collaboration with uh, George Brecht, another Fluxus artist. And he came up with this idea of an eternal network of artists, a community of artists, someone would be coming into it, some were there for a long time, some were just coming in, but there was always someone there to kind of impart the knowledge of the network. And this gathering, this weekend, is so emblematic of that because we've got these old school artists here, you know, that have been involved since the early 70s, late 60s, and a lot of new people who are just coming into the field. So this is truly an eternal network of male art that continues to go on and on and on, and I'm just so happy about that and everything. And the uh, foundation for the eternal network, this community of artists, was built upon the um, foundation of Ray Johnson, uh, an artist uh, from Detroit, Michigan, who went to Black Mountain College, and instead of becoming famous, like his schoolmates, Robert Rauschenberg, Cy Twomley, um, started sending art through the mail for free. And then uh, after uh, some time, started putting ad and pass on his, uh, on his letters. And this is the way the network kind of rippled out and spread. And one of the first places it spread to was the West Coast. And that's what we're going to be discussing today, the evolution of mail art on the West Coast. And we're so lucky to have Anna Banana here, who is active in San Francisco, as well as Vancouver. And uh, she'll be talking about that aspect. Carl Chu, who's uh, from Seattle, and he'll be talking about this Seattle scene. Leslie Caldera, or Creative Thing, who'll be talking about Los Angeles. And we're very pleased to have Lowell Darling here, who is a conceptual artist in the early 70s, also active in male art, and the organizer of Decadance, which was the first real big gathering of male artists, which happened here on the West Coast. And um, he'll be imparting the history of that. So without further ado, Anna Banana. <laughs> Thanks, John. I think you've given several of the items that I had in my introduction. However, um, I did want to say about this weekend that this has been one of the most um, upbeat and enthusiastic gatherings and demonstrations of this networking process that Ray Johnson started. Because really what I see as the product of his work, aside from the postcards and the mailings and the, you know, all the little things that we send back and forth to each other. It's the creation of this network, which is a community of creative people who believe in being creative without hey, saying, well, it's going to cost you $500 or it's going to cost you thousands or, you know, there, there's none of that economic aspect to mail art. You, you send out as much as you can afford to and you get back. I can't tell you after 40 plus years of mail art networking, I, um, I don't know what to do with it all. I've got so much. And, and people have given me banana items, not just banana stories, <laughs> clippings. I, I have the history from the 19, early 1970s. Anyway, I wanted to acknowledge and thank the organizers and John and uh, everybody who contributed their energy to putting this weekend together because it was truly an amazing get together. So I'm gonna start now with a 1968 issue of Art Forum in which Michael Morris, who was the person artist in Vancouver who started Image Bank, um, had, a, had a review and they reproduced a painting of his called The Problem of Nothing. And Ray Johnson, he wrote Michael Morris a letter care of the Vancouver Art Gallery and he said, well, you know, nothings is uh, what I've been doing during the time that every other avant-garde artist is doing happenings. He's been doing nothings. And so Michael Morrison, he conversed. Michael invited him to Vancouver for a show of concrete poetry that he had organized at University of British Columbia. Ray went, and they got together, and I guess there was a lot of exchanging of addresses. So soon after that came out the Image Bank request list, 
1969, in which the artists that had been in this network had put out what things that they would like to receive, and there were things like clouds or 60s cars and so on. And um, that's how I got involved in the network, but I'm going to talk about a couple of other people first. Um, what happened with the Image Bank request list was that File Magazine started publishing in Toronto, and that was a group called General Idea. There were three men, and File was in the format of a life magazine, but totally ironic and amusing and... Um, uh, what's the word I want? Uh, subs un it's like undermining. <laughs> what parody. A parody, sure. Uh, that wasn't quite, I wanted something that was like attacking the way that Life Magazine presents the world. Suppressive. Suppressive. So what? Subversive. Subversive, thank you. That's the word. <laughs> okay, so then I'm just going to cover the Vancouver scene because at the same time as these things were happening with Michael Morris and so on, Ed Varney, who was a conceptual poet, he uh, participated in an exhibition in uh, the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, and, he's, and he got the contact lists of artists that were interested in doing that kind of thing, and then he saw the Image Bank uh, postcard show at UBC in 1969, and so he got linked up both through the, in, and he started putting out the Intermedia newsletter, and in 1973 he got a pinhole perforator. Every male artist's dream come true, and of course he began making stamp editions, and his first editions came out of uh, Intermedia Press, which became a commercial enterprise, and it was a, a collaborative sheet of stamps with the artists that he knew in the network. So that was Ed. He's also been very active all through the years in organizing exhibitions and mail art shows. Uh, he's done one on Elvis, he did a Mo Mona Lisa show, and in more recent years he's done a series of exhibitions on works, which is a labor, um, labor movement thing. So that is Ed's early participation in the network. And then, of course, we have in 1968, Lowell Darling here was nailing cities down and uh, doing urban, urban architecture. And he connected with the network through Dana Atchley, who had taught at University of Victoria and became friends with Eric Medcalf, who became part of Image Bank in Vancouver. I mean, it's all just like these connections going on. And Dana actually, after his, uh, I think he had a row with Vic University of Victoria and he quit, but then he had a van and he went around to various university circuit and he was presenting his assembly magazines. Now I imagine most of you know what an assembling magazine is. Is there anybody who doesn't? Okay, an assembling magazine is one where, say, I decide I'm going to do one. I send out, I want uh, 50 sheets of your work uh, at a certain size, and you send me the 50 sheets, I collate them with everybody else's 50 sheets, bind them, you get a copy, everyone that's in it gets a copy, and then it goes out through whoever um, is in my network that I want to bless with that particular publication. So that was Dana Ashley's thing, so it's called Space Atlas, and he traveled around in his van, and then in 71, we had Ken Friedman, who was a young upstart, so to speak, in the Fluxus movement. <laughs> and he came to Vancouver to do an installation at the Vancouver uh, Public Art Gallery. And um, he also started a little publication called The Weekly Breeder. And, this, and I received a copy of that early on. It's a Sock of the Month Club, sort of a pun on the Book of the Month Club. And it was a sock <laughs> with, an, with an announcement that this was the Sock of the Month Club. So here's Ken Friedman. In 71-72, I had declared myself the town fool of Victoria. And I got a mailing of the Image Bank request list from friends in Vancouver. And I had started publishing the banana rag to sort of try to clue the Victoria audience into what the heck the town fool was up to, which was always mysterious to them. <laughs> anyway, um, so I get the Image Bank request list, and I was like, well, this is fantastic, because Victoria was a real uphill climb. I can tell you, if I did what I was doing in Victoria and San Francisco, it would have been, oh, yes, of course, come on, yeah, let's do it. In Victoria, it was like, what? You want to do what? Anyway, um, <laughs> so the I connected with the Image Bank request list. I 
took it and said, oh, this sounds interesting. I sent everything to everyone that they wanted and said, I'm interested in anything and everything about bananas. And believe me, it has not stopped. <laughs> I have a basement full of it. And <laughs> it's just amazing the generosity of this network. I mean, it's just it's mind blowing. So anyway, I came to San Francisco in 73 after touring around visiting a number of my correspondents, including Lowell Darling at one point. I was looking, where am I gonna go next? And it became very apparent very quickly that San Francisco was the place, and this is where I met the Bay Area Dadists, which was Bill Gaglioni, Tim Mancusi, and Charles Ciccadelli. And at that time, they had taken over the Weekly Breeder as a publication, and that became sort of Tim's baby, although the three of them co co collaborated on it. Um, but there were other publications called Quo's, uh, the West Bay Dadist, um, and the, oh, and then Tim and Bill and the Banana Olympics made the Dada Brothers costumes for the Banana Olympics. Now that was an event I staged in Embarcadero Plaza, but I also received race suggestions because it was a parody of the Olympics, race suggestions from the network. And I, and I also had three people from the network came to San Francisco, Klaus Grove from Germany, Marek Konieski from Poland, who sadly missed the event by about five hours, because he didn't get, he didn't speak much English, and he got a bus from New York, and he arrived in town after the event was over, <laughs> which was sort of the Polish joke of the Banana Olympics. <laughs> um, anyway, t how am I doing for time? Five minutes. I got five minutes. Okay, we're, we're going fast here. Take my time. <laughs> no, I won't take your time. <laughs> Never take your time, Lowell. Um, let's see. Oh, and Tim also was into rubber stamps. From having seen Ray Johnson's work, his actually, I missed something about Tim. He was told by his teacher at art school when he was 18 years old, find out about Ray Johnson and get involved with his work. And so Tim went and looked up uh, Johnson's gallery and lo and behold, he just fell in love with the collage techniques that Ray was having and has began corresponding and probably continued until Ray's death. So that was a big influence on Tim. And then the rubber stamps became a thing that he liked. He had some of his illustrations made into rubber stamps. And um, then later on, he became uh, an illustrator for Stamp Fran no, was it? No, it wasn't Stamp Francisco. It was um, <laughs> personal, ex <laughs> personal exchange stamps. And he worked for them for a number of years, designing stamps. And so Tim has been very much involved in the network. And we had uh, Gaglioni, who was my then partner for a while. And uh, I had started Vile magazine when I first came to San Francisco and put out my first issue in 1974 as a parody of Vile, which was a parody of life. And, and the thing about, the reason that I started it was because Vile magazine started getting snooty about the newcomers to the mail art and the crack, quick copy crap that they were getting. It was so lame, it couldn't hardly limp into the wastebasket. And so I thought, well, I happen to think this is a wonderful network and process. And so that was the origin of Vile. And I published uh, four issues myself, and I allowed Gaglioni to edit three. And he changed the format each time, and I was, it got worse and worse. But anyway, not the magazine, the relationship. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we did finally part ways, at, but we did do a, a tour of Europe in 78 that took us to 29 different cities around Europe on the basis of our mail art connections. And it was me who set that trip up, not Bill. Couldn't write his way out of a paper bag. <laughs> I shouldn't be belating my ex on, on the stage, but anyway. Uh, in 19, 1974, Esquire magazine wrote, uh, it was a photo story on called the art, Their Arts Belong to Data. And there was a huge number of photographs of a number of us. Lowell Darling was one of them. Irene Dogmatic was one. Um, I had a list, it doesn't really matter. There was probably about a dozen of us, Dr. Brute and so on, 
po in our various ridiculous, well, some are more ridiculous than others. I was in a banana costume, very, and my first banana costume was hard to recognize as a banana. I'm just on my, my winding down here. <laughs> I, the other thing I really must mention, a couple of things. Lama Mel in 1980 uh, was involved in organizing the Interdata 80 Festival, and they also published the first anthology on correspondence art, called Correspondence Art, in 1980. 84, it was eaten as a part of the dinner of the inter Daddy 84 festivities by Buster Cleveland, who went off to New York after that. Um, and the last person I really would like to mention, because she's going to show up, I believe, this afternoon in Skype, Ginny Lloyd, who first learned about mail art by looking after my and Bill's mail while we did a cross Canada tour in 1980. But she got into it big time and she published. Um, she also organized Interdata 84, which was a major thing, sort of something like what Ginny's doing for this, except the, on a diverse locations. She also published co a copy edit, copy art uh, exhibition, Blitzkunst, and she had a storefront down on something like 7th or 6th Avenue. And uh, <laughs> she called it a storefront exhibition. I slept there one night downstairs in the basement and I was like, we were on the floor and I'm going, is this really okay? <laughs> anyway, Ginny is, um, I wasn't able to come here to San Francisco, but she did want to be present and I wanted to make sure that you knew about her. She now has an artist stamp museum in Florida. If you ever are heading that way, you should check it out. So I shall hand this over now to whoever is going to be next. I guess you'll do an introduction. Thank you, John. Thank you, Anna. Uh, next up, Leslie Caldera, also known as Creative Thing from Los Angeles, who will give us a bit of history of Los Angeles male art. Okay. Leslie. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, I discovered mail art in 1976. I was attending Cal State Fullerton, and somebody had put a display of mail art in one of the, uh, kind of a bulletin board, board behind glass display windows. And I was just absolutely taken with that idea, and I started making things right away. You know, I was already a collage assemblage artist, so that, that uh, connected with me on a number of levels that I really liked. Uh, but it wasn't until about 1978 that I actually figured out there were other people I could send this stuff to. <laughs> and uh, I started entering mail art shows in 78, I think. And by 1982, I organized my first mail art show, Paper Ambassadors at Whittier College, which is where I was living at the time. And uh, <clears throat> shortly after that, I started corresponding with other Los Angeles mail artists, such as uh, Michael Millett and Lon Spiegelman, primarily. And it didn't take long to uh, get invited to a mail art uh, gathering at Lon Spiegelman's house. Uh, Lon was kind of the hub of Los Angeles mail art. He was very uh, outgoing, very uh, open and welcoming of everybody. I felt totally uh, a kindredship with him immediately. And uh, it, most of the activities in Los Angeles happen around him and at his home. Uh, he had a really uh, a glorious, large, old uh, craftsman house in, in Silver Lake. So central, central location, big space, and uh, a, uh, a willing host. So uh, that, that was kind of the, the center of Los Angeles activities and, and uh, everything that went, went on in, in Los Angeles from the very early 80s when I started getting involved with them to uh, at least 1987 was centered around Silver Lake and Lon's home. Um, I, I guess uh, I, ju I just saw my opening remarks here, which I completely skipped over. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess I knew even back then that if you stuck with something long enough, you'd become some kind of uh, authority or historical figure uh, in the activity. And, uh, and uh, definitely if you live long enough. And I think that that's just starting to happen for me as far as male art. Um, you know, at that time and all these years, I felt like I was a, a willing participant. I entered as many male art shows as I found out about. I was very active and, and corresponded with a lot of male artists all around the world. 
Um, but now it's become history and it's taken to another level. Um, Lon, Lon Spiegelman uh, experienced some uh, personal issues that forced him to uh, withdraw or, or step back from male art in the late, in the early 90s, I guess, yeah. And uh, uh, sadly, he passed away in 2002 um, at the age of 61. Uh, and um, as soon as Lon stood back, stepped back from his activities, the, all the air seemed to be taken out of the Los Angeles uh, male art community. Uh, some of us, uh, like myself and Scooter and John Tostado and, and others, uh, continued to correspond and, and do exhibitions and activities, but we didn't have that hub anymore. And that's something that uh, I think I, I still miss to today. You know, lots of good memories and, and uh, great times with all kinds of different people. Whenever a male artist came to Los Angeles from someplace else, they would uh, invariably stay with Lon, and Lon would throw a big party for them. I remember going to Lon's house for uh, gatherings for uh, Wally Darnell, Al Ackerman, Peter Kusterman, John Held Jr. from Dallas, Texas, uh, among others. Uh, but uh, as I said, it, you know, it, it, we, we become part of history because time has gone back by now. And unfortunately, part of that time going by is, is us losing some of the, the people who are very involved, uh, very uh, integral to the, the Los Angeles male art community. Uh, another person that we've lost recently, about five years ago, was Judith Hofberg. And uh, her focus was artist books and uh, her magazine, Umbrella, was uh, pretty much uh, dedicated to that, but she always had space for male art in, in Umbrella Magazine. I know that, that myself and a lot of other male artists subscribe to it just for the male art exhibit listings. In a, in a time before the internet and uh, the digital technology that runs our lives these days, uh, that, that was a vital link for male artists to the outside world and who was doing what and where to send uh, work for exhibitions that were coming up. And I think that uh, Judith, all the time, uh, despite what she might have told you, um, she, she had, she had a, a real sincere love for male art and even for male artists. And you know that came, that came through very clearly in her including male art in Umbrella and the, the parties and activities that she participated in and organized for us in Los Angeles. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of other artists who, who we've lost over the years. Uh, Rudolph and Jimmy, Emba, Jimmy Evans uh, were very active in the 1980s. Uh, unfortunately, they uh, succumbed at a time when there was very little that could be done for AIDS, and uh, they did not survive that. And more recently, uh, another artist who was very active in the 80s, Manoy, uh, passed away a few years ago from uh, uh, just getting old, like the rest of us. Um, so so in, in retrospect, it seems like it was a short period of time, even though I've continued uh, doing male art and other Los Angeles artists are continue, have continued uh, producing male art and participating, uh, but a very short time that's now kind of sealed in the amber of, of history that I'll never forget, and I suppose uh, in the future it'll be talked about and recorded. But. Uh, um, as, as Anna said, the, the eternal network goes on and uh, more people come in as others exit and uh, it's something that I hope that uh, will continue for us as, as long as we can see into the future. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, I might add that after Lon's death, his family contacted me to do something with his correspondence and I was able to place it in the Getty Research Library. So I was very happy to do that as a tribute to the line, who was an inspiration to me. Could, could Next, I add something? Sure. I'm, I'm sorry to butt in. Uh, I was at the Getty recently, um, and uh, those uh, papers and that collection is available for viewing. You just have to call ahead and make a reservation. But any weekday, uh, anybody can go there and, and look through the Spiegelman collection. Yeah, and I think these you know, new archives that are going into libraries and museums are making a big evolution in mail art because now um, academics are, have places to go to research the field and it's becoming more and more 
mainstream, talked about, whatever. It's become like a, a, a social practice uh, aspect of contemporary art, so it's getting more and more attention. Next up, Carl Chu, probably the dean of the Seattle Artist Stamp School. <laughs> All right, a few of you have these posters, so I'm gonna just encourage you to unroll them and follow along with me. I, I think if you roll them down from the top, and then you can, you can kind of roll them up from the bottom as we go along. Um, but I, I wonder, this, this poster right here is called the, uh, An Evolutionary Baobab of, of uh, Artist Stamp Correspondence. And um, it really is uh, an example of what everybody at this table has said that the network um, starts in a place and expands outward. And that's been the total story of my involvement in mail art. So I'm gonna sit down now and uh, go ahead and talk a little bit. And so if you're, uh, if you're following along, um, I made stamps as a child. I used to paint tickets and I, I'd made little things. I love. I thought of myself as a uh, counterfeiter. <laughs> and I was fascinated by counterfeiting. My mom used to tell me stories about how during uh, concentration camps, people used to carve rubber stamps that looked like, you know, a Nazi passport stamps and things like that. And I could not imagine how that was possible. So I began trying it myself. And I, and I, and I did um, all kinds of things all the way through um, high school. Um, once a postal inspector came to my middle school science class and hauled me out because I had made a United States stamp. I'd actually drawn it on the paper. I, I had tried perforating with my mom's sewing machine, but it made these squiggly little lines and they weren't very satisfying. So I learned that to actually do the perforations right, I had to draw them perfectly. So I drew the stamps, made all the little shadows just right, made all the little perforations just right. And this was a particular stamp that was a worm commemorative and U.S. worm commemorative, and the worm actually came out of the stamp and went into the envelope, and I mailed it to my dad, but the postal service got it because it said U.S. postage on it. And so they came to my school, and the, the guy was really nice. He was really tall. He had very shiny black shoes, and they sat me down in the boy dean's office, and he just said, he had the envelope, and he said, did you do this? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, well, we really want to encourage you to design stamps, but you always have to not put U.S. postage on them. So they were very, very sweet to me, you know? <laughs> like, it was cool, okay? Um, when I was in college, I was a zoology major. I had no idea about art. I, I didn't ever even think about art until I was a senior. And then I met a, a professor at UW in the art school. I'd wanted to be a marine biologist, but I started hanging out with him. And the reason I met, I hung out with him, his name was Bill Ritchie, was because I went to a gallery and saw his work and he was making etchings of stamps, his own stamps. He was actually making little beautiful little prints. And he inspired me to get back in school in the art department, not become a zoologist, and actually pursue a career in uh, printmaking and video. And um, the minute the color Xerox machine was invented, the little wheels in my head just spun like crazy, and I said, color stamps. <laughs> and uh, the f I heard there was one in New York. It was probably one that Ed Higgins used, Todd Jorgensen's, I don't know, but uh, I sent my friend there to New York. She was going to New York with my first chicken issue, and uh, she couldn't find it and came back and gave it to me. And I was very disappointed. But a week later, a color Xerox machine ended up in Seattle, and somehow they called me. They knew I was looking for one. They called me on the phone, invited me to come over and use it, and that was my first sheet of stamps, and it was the, it was the beginning of, right at the beginning of 1975. So immediately, uh, I knew that I had to also get a perforating machine, and uh, I called a used printing equipment company, and a half hour later, they called back, and they had located one in a guy's garage, and it was $75, and I was like, oh, well, imagine me, that was so much money. I was like, <laughs> I don't know. And then my friend Bill said, you want to make stamps, you better go out and buy it. So I drove out and I bought it. And, and I can't tell you <laughs> where that perforating machine has taken me. It's a Latham manufacturing perforator. It's called the monitor. I think it's named after the, like the Mary Mac and the monitor. You know, you know these things, they're like made of steel or pig iron. They are so heavy and 
Um, and I've, had, I've perforated a million things and had a million other people perforate things on it. Okay, so I'm, I'm making stamps in my studio in Seattle. I enter an art show in Seattle called Footprint, and I win a prize. Wow, <laughs> I won a prize in an art show. And um, uh, so uh, about a day before the opening of the show, I'm in my studio, and there's this huge smashing on the door. And I hear this voice that's, that says, Carl Chu, I'm Ed Higgins. I'm from New York, and I make stamps too. <laughs> Ed, hold your hand up. Ed's over here. And, uh, <laughs> Now, this was news to me, because in Seattle, no one had ever heard. I'm, I'm serious. You talk about anybody in Seattle, any curator, gallery, no one had ever heard of anybody making stamps before. And here was this upstart kid making his own postage stamps. But then I met Ed, and Ed was like, you make stamps, and you don't know who Ray Johnson is, and you don't know all these people? It's like, <laughs> you couldn't hardly believe his eyes. And because of Ed, all of my correspondence just took off, sort of like the Big Bang. It went like that. And if you look at this poster, um, you can start seeing right away I was corresponding with Buster Cleveland. Uh, it turned out there was another person in Seattle who very quickly started making stamps. His name was Robert Rudine, and some of you know him as Dogfish. Um, and my friend Bill Ritchie started making stamps. So um, Bill and I were making stamps. And then I began corresponding with people. The, the first big people I corresponded with were Harley. He was here. That was uh, in the late 70s. Um, uh, Cavallini started sending me round trips. I, could, I didn't know who this guy was. And George Machunas actually came to my studio and spent a week at my studio making fluxus things like ping pong tables with holes in the, in the paddles, <laughs> and, a, and a, a bathroom where if you wanted to pee, you had to climb up eight feet and try to aim down through this long thing. <laughs> you know, that really was mind boggling because George had made stamps. And so he traded stamps and we did a little collaborative piece together. Then uh, a lot of people were starting to mention to me, there was a, somebody up in um, Vancouver named uh, Jazz Felter, and you're gonna get to see him later. Oh, you make stamps? Well, you should contact Jazz Felter. He's already had a show of artist stamps up in Vancouver. So then I had to get to know Jazz. And through Jazz, I met Anna Banana, Ed Varney, and it just took off. So then what happened in Seattle? Because I was making stamps and Dogfish was making stamps, anything like that spawns a whole bunch of other people wanting to make stamps. And pretty quickly, a whole little group of Seattle artist stamp makers formed. And um, if you look on the poster, Dominic is over on the left side uh, with his number 70 uh, tax paid stamp. And uh, he's also known as Bug Post. And he was exceptionally active in the 80s and 90s. Um, the neatest thing about Bug Post is many of us have tried sewing machines as a perforator. Bug Post is a genius. So Bug Post said, I don't need to spend $3,000 on a perforator or 1000 whatever it was back then. I'm going to turn a sewing machine into a real perforator. And he redid his sewing machine so it had places to feed the stamps. He shaved off the needle so that it was a flat, and he made a little template for it to go through. So it punched one hole at a time perfectly through this. You couldn't move the sheet sideways, so the perforations were perfectly straight. And he got very good at putting it through. And the thing I liked about his stamps were the perforations were actually a little bit bigger than normal perfor perforations. And I kind of always have liked bigger perforations rather than smaller ones. Uh, then over on the right-hand side, there was an exotica post, Sheba de Kitty. And she tended to make stamps uh, with uh, people in very compromising positions. <laughs> uh, Bug Post introduced me to Francis Hall. Francis was a kite enthusiast, but he made, his post office was Kite Post, and so he made all these hundreds of beautiful stamps about kites. And he would go to all the kite conventions and have his stamps at the conventions. Sadly, Francis took his own life uh, in about 1990 or a little bit before, and so he's not with us. Um, over on the left-hand side, the love stamp, the uh, takeoff on the love stamp is Jeff Dixon. 
And uh, he's still active in Seattle, makes a sheet of stamps every once in a while. Um, then going uh, up a little farther, there's some other people who are here. There's Eleanor Kent. I've got one of her fractal um, uh, um, crochet pieces. And Eleanor, are you here, Eleanor? Yeah, there she is back in the back. Yeah. I met Eleanor when I came to Interdata 84 and met Jenny Lloyd and a bunch of other people. Met uh, Mike Millette, uh, Scooter, who is here. Scooter, raise your hand. Uh, Scooter was already a stamp artist, and he'd already, he and I had already been corresponding. So, um, but that was an event here in San Francisco, just like this event, where people come and you meet people that you may have never met, but you may have corresponded a few times with. And to, today, you know, yesterday was, uh, I met John Tostado, and I met Nico, and I met a bunch of other people who, um, who I had never known, the sticker dude. Uh, it's really great to come to something like this and um, meet people for the first time. Up in the upper right-hand corner, I'm sure I'm just about out of time, there's a whole group of people that then started making stamps, and they all came to my studio to use my perforator. So there was never a day at my studio where there weren't one or two people perforating like hundreds of sheets of stamps. Uh, Tisha, who's still very active, but she's really more of a book artist now. Um, Beth Sellers was the uh, curator at a local museum. Sandy Jackson, Bimbalonia Post, um, uh, is still lives in Seattle, and. Um, um, Tim Lord actually came from over from Spokane to perforate his stamps. Um, Elizabeth Zoz, Zoz, Z O I S, now lives in New York. And Marvin Johnson, um, he'd actually been somebody that had come to my shows for years and years, and just, you know, he's one of those people who came to your show and just looked up in your eyes like, oh, Carl Chu. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I was so glad when he started making his own stamps, because <laughs> then I could like be on a more level playing field with him. So he became a Bufo Post, and his stamps are just absolutely gorgeous. And the last person, uh, there's two more people I'm going to um, recognize here on this. Uh, Jerry Smith, another a commercial artist in Seattle, began making stamps. But then um, in about 2009, I met Jack L Lateman who uh, is Cascadia Art Post, and Jack's here too. He was here yesterday. So uh, that's a brief history of artist stamps and, uh, in Seattle and the stamp art scene in Seattle. And uh, well, it's, it's still incredibly rich. Um, I enjoy now, um, for, for many of the first years, I actually thought I could make my living off of selling artist stamps. And I did <laughs> actually sell a lot of them back in the 80s. Uh, I think the price eventually went up in a gallery to $125 a sheet. Then the tech bubble burst, uh, galleries all went out of business in Seattle, and I, have, I stopped being able to sell anything, and it's actually led to a much healthier attitude. Um, I got, went back to school, became a teacher, so now I'm a teacher, I earn my money from that, and I can make all the mail art I want and send it out, and I don't even have to worry about it, and as I told John, I am so much happier. <laughs> Paul Chu. You know, Anna mentioned previously that uh, Tim Mancusi of the Bay Area Dottas found out about uh, mail art in New York from his teacher and, who told him to go visit Ray Johnson. And that teacher was Stephen Kaltenbach, uh, who's a noted uh, California conceptual artist who left New York and uh, went to Sacramento for a long time. And it was instrumental bringing uh, Ray Johnson to uh, Sacramento. Uh, another conceptual artist of that period was Lowell Darling, and uh, he's our next uh, panelist, Lowell Darling. I'd actually rather listen. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize that uh, um, since the topic I'm supposed to talk about, the decadence, which was for myself and a lot of artists that I was involved with, a sort of um, end of uh, correspondence art. And I realized that uh, it was also, like everybody calls themselves, male artists. And um, as I recall, before the decadence, it was correspondence art, you know? And um, 
uh, I think that the male artists seem to have had more fun than the correspondence artists. <laughs> but I think that the reason is that the male art grew out of correspondence art, and correspondence uh, art grew out of far too serious an art world uh, for them, and which is why they turned to creating their own networks and systems and uh, taking charge of uh, essentially um, what they did with their work. And um, so anyway, I, uh, I made a note here, uh, there was something, uh, oh, my introduction to the mail, I thought I'd add that quickly. Uh, uh, I was 14 years old and I had heard that Norman Rockwell didn't do commercials and then the Rock Island Argus, I grew up in Rock Island, Illinois, uh, I saw a Norman Rockwell drawing on a uh, four roses or three roses of whiskey ad. And so I knew that he lived in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, so I wrote to him <laughs> and asked him, uh, you know, what, what is this? And he <laughs> wrote me back and said um, that um, when he was young, uh, before he had a name, when he sold something, he couldn't control what the person did with it once they bought it, because artists didn't have copyright laws like artists and musicians, I mean, writers and musicians. And so this is 1956, I'm 14, and I was determined to become famous before I ever tried to sell any art. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I'm now 72 years old and pretty much stuck to that uh, <laughs> plan, which really, uh, being a pro bono public performance artist, which is actually what I call myself, is, is not a really wise business plan. <laughs> and the... Um, I was, the Decadence was one of several large events uh, that I created primarily through the mail. And another one was uh, called the Artists and Lawyers Ball. And in 1968, because I wasn't making any money as an artist, the IRS declined to accept my deductions and uh, said that I was not an artist. So I set out to prove that I was an artist without making, selling, or showing art. <laughs> and at the same time, I was sweeping the floors in Buckminster Fuller's office as my student job. And uh, he was working on population crisis statistics and um, you know all the world resources inventory. And um, I decided that I would nail down Carbondale, Illinois, where Bucky was, and I was, and uh, to keep it from falling off the planet due to the excess weight of overpopulation coupled with the centrifugal force of the Earth. <laughs> and um, a, another student from the campus uh, newspaper put it on the UP wire services, and the next morning I was, it was a caricature of an artist looking very much like Salvador Dali you know, uh, with a great big hammer and a great big nail on a little teeny world on the front page of the Chicago Daily News or the Tribune, I can't remember. And, uh, you know, artists, <laughs> you know, nails world. And uh, I, uh, I continued to do this uh, practice uh, from that point on. Uh, and so my mail was primarily uh, the art of crank letters beginning in 1956 with Norman. And um, a lawyer, Monroe Price, uh, uh, was uh, trying to start an organization called the Advocates for the Arts, which was the first pro bono public, uh, or, you know, or po pro bono legal service for artists. And he couldn't find any artists with, with, you know, that would come to lawyers to talk to them about their problem. You know, we like to solve our own problems our way, you know, like driving the bureaucrats crazy. So anyway, he took my case, and he did in, you know, five minutes what it had taken me years to do. But during these years, I became kind of quasi-famous uh, because I made an enormous amount of news. Um, 
nailing cities to the ground all over Europe, you know, in America, uh, very hit and run. And so anyway, uh, he had, you know, I, I gotten a teaching job at Otis Art Institute, which was next door to the Elks building where the decadence, <laughs> now that there's a connection, finally. <laughs> anyway, I've been three years by myself. I'm no good at talking, uh, you know, with any kind of logic. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, this lawyer proved I was an artist, and uh, but I'd been teaching. Uh, I was on a panel at the College Art Association with Bruce Nauman, and Bruce had been offered this teaching job, teach video at Otis Art Institute. He already had Leo Castelli. He didn't really need the job. I needed the job, so I took it. They didn't have video equipment at Otis. So I was teaching video without video. <laughs> so the first day of class, I asked my students what grade they wanted. They all said they wanted A's, except one woman that said she wanted a B, and I said, won't you take an A? And she said, I don't, I, I don't think I'm an A artist. Uh, and at this point, they didn't know I was a teacher. I just, we were sitting around waiting for the teacher. <laughs> and I, I pulled my grade book out. And then I said, A, 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 are you sure you don't want to be? I said, I'm a teacher, you could have the, an A. No, OK, all right, B. <laughs> and I said, now we don't have video equipment, so let's turn this into a, a, a male art, a correspondence art um, entity. So they decided to call themselves General Otis, and uh, I decided that, uh, I said I, I made them a promise to get them in art in America. <laughs> As a teacher, it was the least I could do. <laughs> so David Zack, uh, uh, the Canadian art writer, and a friend of a lot of, uh, you know, male artists and stuff, you know, who absolutely went mad. He was the craziest human on earth. Anyway, uh, David had written an article that a lot of the early correspondence artists hated, uh, and it was called Male Art, uh, blah, blah, I don't know what all. But it was mainly about artists who were worked in clay, like Clayton Bailey and, you know, people like this that were using the mail as well. So all the correspondence artists, you know, image bankers and everybody, they thought this was, uh, you know, not the company they wanted to be in. But my students were very happy because the cover was a big mail of, uh, a, a bag of a postal canvas bag of mail with all the mail pouring out, and um, there were a couple of them that were General Otis. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I I, uh, I quit teaching because uh, Dana Ashley, another correspondent artist and I, a space company, were uh, doing very well traveling around around the country, me as a Fat City School of Fines Art and with the pseudonym Dudley Fines, and he was a space and Dana would connect one artist with other artists and you know, he was part of this uh, network and I would give a master's degree to anybody that wanted one. <laughs> now, when I got my MFA, they realized that I didn't have a bachelor's degree at the time, but I was also more famous than anybody else in the faculty you know, uh, and so they sent me the degree in abstentia when I was in London nailing it down. So I got both of my degrees in the mail at the same time, and there was a woman down the corner who was insane and she lost her legs, but they were under her, but she didn't know it. And every day she'd ask me if I'd seen her legs, and I said, there they are, and she'd say, thank you, and go on her way. <laughs> so one day she asked me where her legs at time, Oh, the decadence. We haven't got to the decadence. Well, it was a great big party. This woman, uh, I gave her my bachelor's degree. Uh, and then we had the decadence. Right. And we lived happily ever after. And, oh, I had so many funny little I know. stories. We'll do here. a next panel. No, no next problem. time. Yeah. Next time in Israel. Yeah, maybe we can have like five minutes of oh, Jerusalem. Uh, questions and answers. <laughs> Thanks, Lo Lo I'm Darling. only quarter Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jenny, do we have time for questions? Or? Okay. Anybody want to take it? Um, 
I don't see the demise of the Postal Service, to tell you the truth. You know, the thing about the Postal Service, they're the only people to go around to every house in the frickin' country. So, I mean, why can't they take some social service action, you know, to look in on, on the elderly or this or that? I think the Postal Service just has to change a little bit, you know, and, and draw upon what it's so good at, which is, you know, communicating with people and everything like that. A lot of people also say that, uh, you know, male art is dead, you know, the, it was a, a, a force for social connection in the old days, and now, you know, the internet does that, so who needs, you know, the Postal Service or male art? And I always say, have you seen the work that Carl Chu is doing? It's about the best male art I've seen in 30 years. So, I mean, male art is not dying if there's people like Carl Chu and other people around the world doing what they're doing. I want to say something. In the back? Yes? Yeah, well, fortunately not. Go ahead, Annie. <laughs> uh, that's a, it isn't easy to explain male art to people who aren't involved. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost inconceivable. Many people never even use the postal system at this point. And a letter writing, I mean, why would you write a letter? You can send an email or, you know, you can connect on Facebook or any of these other things. So um, I would say that uh, suggest sending them to a website. Uh, do you have a website that, that explains mail art? Somebody have a, <laughs> anybody? It's out there. What? Yeah, I mean, just Google mail art and there it is. I mean, this used to be an underground art form that you could. Yeah, but. Um, yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, M -A -I -L, not yeah. M -A -L. And it's, uh, it's now, online. If I could just mention one other and thing, and then I'll turn it over to other people. Uh, there male art's connect. like this pool. <laughs> Whatever you say about male art, it reflects more on you than it does on male art. I mean, male art is just this Well, big, it's communication, you know, thing. and it's using the Postal Service to communicate with other people of like minds or not like minds who want to share information, um, objects, Whatever you like. Sometimes they put together publications. Sometimes they do their own work that they want to get to you through the mail. Sometimes they want to come to your town and just hang out. It's like, it's just a network, like Anna said earlier. I want to give everybody my address. I'd like to give back in the mail art movement. <laughs> so before you leave, pick, take your pencils out. And the last thing we'll do is I'll give you my address. And I'll send you all an MFA. <laughs> I don't know if this is on or not. Anyway, um, I just wanted to mention that this male art is so sophisticated. I think of Connie Wang, um, who um, we both used to work for Bart at one time, and she had this wonderful, um, where she would cancel her stamp that she had made. And I remember this one time it was used in Marilyn Monroe also, and then she had her address on it. And just that simple, humble statement, I still cherish it, and this was from the late 80s. But also I wanted to comment that since the 50s, I have kept in touch with my, we keep in touch, my Japanese pen pal and I. I still have all the, st the times we'd spent put on all these commemorative stamps and add to it. And that's just a humble form between two people. And I'm thinking, and really for quite a few years now, well, eight, that with youth today, to encourage them to write a letter, whether it's doing the teachers like how they have pen pals, but just to start writing and actually go to the post office and get a stamp and put on it, that we can, we can keep this going. And also, I was just reading in the Daily Cal yesterday, somebody had written a, um, a column stating that we're, we're soon going to forget how to do cursive. And it's becoming a lost art. So I think just in our humble ways and spreading a buzz around besides here and the networking within to open it up. And I know I'm doing what I can in all sorts of classrooms as a substitute teacher K through 12. So I encourage us all to do what we can besides here. And I'm just grateful for the, um, the examiner having that little blurb there to know it was here today. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. How about one more in the back? Or it's you, Jenny. Go ahead. I have a question for Carl, actually. 
actually. I want to know, um, you talked about that worm stamp. Yeah. Did they give it back to you? Yes. And do you still have it? I think my dad has it somewhere. <laughs> yes, joking. Uh, and this is for Mr. Darling. Uh, I've actually been studying your work since I was in college. I was very inspired by your take on politics, combining not just art with politics, but humor. And I've extended that into my involvement with the San Francisco Pride and the Radical Fairies. Much to some people's great annoyance, I never <laughs> stop. I never stop talking. It goes on forever. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Wait a minute, I was gonna give you my address. Instead, uh, you can find it, I, I, okay, 101 Rodeo Avenue, Rodeo, California, 94572.